Hello, Summit Church. Hey, this is Wednesday, and I uh, want to welcome you to our Wednesday service. And, uh, uh, you know, it's the Wednesday before Easter. And uh, as I was praying and, and thinking about things, it just seemed good to look at the sequence of events on the day that Christ died. Now, a lot of people think that he died on a Friday, but if you study into it, which I'm not going to get into all of that here, but if you study into it, he died on a Wednesday. And so, that being the case, I just thought it was fitting to go through the sequence of events uh, the day that our Lord died. And so, let's do that. Uh, actually, the events began the evening before, and... Uh, Jesus, with his disciples, observed Passover, and he institutes the Lord's Supper, which uh, we're going to be uh, honoring that this Friday at 7 p.m., so I want to encourage you to tune in then, have some juice and some bread, and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be celebrating that this Friday right here at 7 p.m., but anyway... Uh, they observed the Passover, Jesus and his disciples. And it's interesting, uh, the disciples get into an argument about who would be the greatest among them. And they did that frequently. You wouldn't think that, uh, that they would argue about that as much as they did. But certainly you wouldn't think that they'd be doing it at the Last Supper. But they were arguing about who, who among them was going to be the greatest. And Jesus... Uh, taught them about servanthood, and he, in fact, washed their feet. And, um, and, and you know, he, he always brought out to them that if you wanted to be the greatest, you needed to, to be the least and be a servant of all. And that a servant, of course, is the greatest. And so Jesus taught them, them that. And uh, then, of course, Jesus identified uh, his betrayer uh, and... and uh, and so on and so forth, you know. And, of course, the disciples all wanted to know who, who it was among them that was going to betray him. But, of course, it was, it was Judas. And, of course, he told Judas before Judas left, you know, whatever you do, do quickly. And, of course, then Judas left the, left the, the room and went out to betray the Lord. And then Jesus, of course, comforted his, his disciples. And he exhorted them about many things. And then at some point, they sang a hymn, and they departed for the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, on the way to the garden, Jesus continued to comfort them and exhort them and warn them about things. And uh, he, he, he had some astounding things to say to them on that walk over to the garden. And, and, and anyway, um, and of course, during this time, Jesus pre predicted that Peter would deny him. You know, uh, Peter said he would, he would defend Jesus even with his life. And, and Jesus told Peter that before the rooster would crow, that, that he would deny him three times. And, um, and then, of course, Jesus, Jesus prayed extensively for many different things. Anyway, they get to the garden. And with Peter, James, and John, he departs a distance from the others. And then Jesus moved further on yet past Peter, James, and John. And uh, <clears throat> he began to pray. And of course, you know, Peter, James, and John, <clears throat> excuse me, were sleeping uh, during this time. And uh, uh, when Jesus w was praying. And uh, as he was praying, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, he, said, he said to the Father, he said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then, of course, an angel appeared to the Lord and strengthened him. And, and, and an interesting thing, he, he was in, in great agony. And as he was praying, he sweat, the Bible said, great drops of blood and, and it fell to the ground. Uh, just imagine that, the agony that our Lord was in as the cross lay just out in front of him and, uh, and, and, and the, the awesome price that he was going to have to pay for you and for me. And then 
Of course, Judas had carried out his betrayal, and, uh, and he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, uh, the price of a, of a slave. Just, just think about that. To, to betray Jesus at all, but for 30 pieces of silver, just... Anyway, uh, the troops, of course, and there's a lot of, lot of uh, soldiers, quite, quite a few, a, a multitude of them, a lot of soldiers came to take Jesus. It wasn't just a few soldiers, but it was, it was a large number that came with Judas. And, of course, Judas identified Jesus and betrayed him with a kiss. And uh, it's interesting that Jesus called Judas friend. Now you think about that. Uh, think about the, the, the awesome love that our Lord has uh, to call him friend at a time like that. And then as the uh, soldiers show up, they, uh, they say, we're looking for Jesus. And Jesus said, I am he. Well, I tell you what, when Jesus said that, he said, I am. Uh, the Bible says they, they drew back and fell to the ground. I mean, the power of God knocked those soldiers backward down. I mean, they were, they, were, they were leveled down on the ground. And then Jesus asked them again, you know, who are you seeking? What this means to me is, remember Jesus said, no, no man takes my life from me. He said, I lay it down and I take it up again. And we need to remember that, that Jesus laid his life down for us voluntarily. Oh, he's wonderful, isn't he? Um, anyway, during this time, uh, I wanted to bring out that, that Peter cut off the servant of the high priest. He cut off his right ear, and Jesus uh, healed it, you know, put it back on, healed it. I mean, think about that. And, and I mean... Jesus is so wonderful. I mean, a person coming to take him, and, and, and Jesus heals the guy. I mean, he, he, I mean he's just wonderful. He, he's just, just full of love. He is love. And the Bible says God is love. And so Jesus, even at a time like that, was healing and helping people. And then, of course, all the disciples forsook the Lord and, and fled, fled away. And then, of course... There was a, prel a preliminary hearing before Annas, the high priest. And then Jesus went, uh, on, he went on, on, on a trial before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. And, and these were not legal, legal things that were, were going on. Uh, but, but they had Jesus on trial nonetheless before Caiaphas. And uh, I want to read from Matthew 26 verses 59 and 60. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false, look at this, many false witnesses came forward, they found none. I mean, think about that. Jesus, he, he's so perfect. Remember, he, he was without sin. He never sinned one time. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And, 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 I mean, they, could, they couldn't find anybody there that could say anything false against him. Um, and, but, but then the Bible says, but at last they found two. They came up, they scrounged up two that had some things to say against him. And, uh, but anyway, that just, that just impresses me. I mean, you know, usually it's real easy to find somebody that can say something against you. But Jesus was so perfect that they, they had a dickens of a time finding anybody that, that could come up with anything. And then, and of course, it was all false testimony they gave toward him or gave about him. And then the Bible says in Mark 14, verse 65, then some began to spit on him. Now think about that. They spit upon our Lord. And they blindfolded him and they beat him. And they began to say to him, prophesy to us, Christ... Who is the one who struck you? And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. And this was just the beginning of the, of the, the horrible things that our Lord was going to have to go through that day. And then, of course, Peter denies Jesus the three times. And, uh, but, but, you know, the Bible says that after Peter did that, 
And, and what a lot of people don't realize is that, that it was within earshot of Jesus. Jesus heard Peter doing this. And, uh, but it's interesting that uh, Peter went out, the Bible said, and he wept bitterly. He repented. And with that heartfelt repentance, of course, Jesus, you know, he forgave him. And then later down the road, used him greatly. Judas, on the other hand, didn't repent. Uh, he, he regretted what he had done, but he didn't truly repent. And of course, he went out and committed suicide. And then, of course, after this took place, Jesus was delivered to Pontius Pilate. Uh, the first time, he came up before Pilate the first time, and Pilate couldn't find any fault in Jesus. And so then he sends Jesus to Herod. And uh, I want to read a few verses here on this. In Luke 23, verse 9, the Bible says, Then Herod questioned Jesus with many words, but he answered him nothing. Jesus didn't answer him anything. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. And, and then it's interesting that Herod and Pilate, they didn't get along. But the Bible brings out that, that, that when Jesus got in between the two of them, they, they made amends, and, and, and then they got along after that. What I take about, uh, away from that is when, you know, when two people are squabbling, if you can just get Jesus in the middle of them, uh, he, can make things, make, he, he can make things good and reconcile things. So, but nonetheless, Herod then, uh, you know, he treated Jesus with contempt and mocked him and so forth, put that gorgeous robe on him and sent him back to Pilate, and now Jesus goes back to Pilate the second time. And of course, Pilate's wife had suffered many things in her dream, being warned uh, uh, of what you know, her husband was going to do to Jesus. And she went to Pilate and said, have nothing to do with harming, harming Jesus. But Pilate, and you know, Pilate, if you study into it, it's very clear. He didn't want to, uh, uh, you know, crucified Jesus and all of that, but, but he was certainly pressured into it by the, by the crowd. And, um, but she had warned her husband, Pilate, not to harm Jesus. Uh, but anyway, the Jews had a custom that a prisoner could be released at Passover. And it came down to Jesus or Barabbas. And of course, Barabbas was a, was a criminal, you know, a murderer and a criminal. And of course, Pilate, Pilate asked the crowd what they wanted. And so the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and then have Jesus put to death. And then Pilate washes his hands before the multitude and he said, I'm innocent of the blood of, of this just person. So you see, he recognized that Jesus was just, but again, he was pressured by the crowd. And then Pilate released Barabbas uh, to the crowd. And uh, then he asked the crowd a question. He says, what shall I do with this Jesus who is called Christ? And you know, that's a, a question. That's the question of the ages for everyone. And it's a question that everyone must answer. What shall I do with this Jesus whom is called Christ? Let me ask you, what are you going to do with Jesus who is called Christ? Some people just ignore him. Some people reject him. And some people receive him as Lord. I want to encourage you today to answer this question the way it needs to be answered. Recognize Jesus as the Christ and receive him as your Savior. The Bible is clear. There's only one way to miss hell and make heaven, and that's to receive Jesus Christ. With a repentant heart, receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So Pilate asked the question, What shall I do with this Jesus who is called Christ? And they all said, now listen what the crowd said, 
they said, let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. And of course, then Pilate had Jesus scourged. It's interesting in the Bible, it, it gives the statement, it says, you know, then they scourged Jesus. It's real easy to read over that, just, well, they scourged him. But we could do a whole study on what the scourging was like. It was a terrible thing. It was a horrible thing. Now, Jesus had already been, 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 been you know, hit and, and so forth and mocked and all of that. But now this scourging, this Roman scourging was, was just, it's, it was a terrible, horrible thing. Uh, some people didn't, didn't survive it. I mean, he, Jesus was, was beaten within an inch of his life. And uh, it would do you well to study sometime about a Roman scourging. Anyway, they scourged our Lord. And we need to remember that, that he, he did that for us. All, everything he's doing here, he's doing for you and me. We, you and I, we deserve to get everything that Jesus got. He, he, he wasn't getting beaten for himself. He was doing it for you and me. He was our substitute. He stepped in for us. And uh, everything that, that they did to him, you and I had coming. You know, he, he's wonderful, isn't he? He is so wonderful. I mean, you know, you study the Bible. He didn't have to come down from heaven and take on human form. I mean, he's, he's God. He's the second member of the Trinity, God the Son. And he became a human being. He didn't have to do that. But he came here born of a virgin and became a man, took on human form. And then, and then went through all of this for you and me so we wouldn't have to. And so we, and so we could miss hell and make heaven. I mean, I, mean, I just fall in love with him when I, when I think about these things. But, uh, but, but he, he was scourged, beaten immersively. And uh, then, then, of course, Pilate's soldiers, they took him into this certain area called a praetorium. And they gathered the whole garrison of of soldiers around him and they, they stripped him and they, uh, they took his clothes off of him and then they put on a scarlet, they put a scarlet robe upon him and then they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Think about that. A crown of thorns. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He could have any crown he wanted. But he was willing to bear that crown of thorns for you and me. And you ought to study into that crown of thorns sometime. How awful that was to have something like that pressed down upon one's head. But he wore that crown of thorns. They put it on his head. And a reed in his right hand, or a, a, like a staff if you will. And they bowed the knee before him and they mocked him. Saying, Hail, King of the Jews. You know, it makes me think. They bowed before him and they mocked. And it's very sad. But there's going to come a time where all of us are going to have to bow our knee before the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord God Almighty. And I tell you what, I've chosen to do that voluntarily because I love him. And I encourage you to do it also. But one way or the other, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But nonetheless, they bowed mocking and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And then they spit upon him. And they took the reed, that, that stick, that staff, and they struck him on the head. And they beat him on the head. And then Pilate presented Jesus to the crowd and said, Behold the man. And the religious leaders and the crowd, they cry out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate then again says, I find no fault in this man. The religious leaders tell Pilate that Jesus, Jesus ought to die because he said he was the Son of God. And Pilate becomes fearful, and then he, he interviews Jesus again. And Pilate tells Jesus that 
he said to Jesus, he said, I have the power to crucify you or to release you. And Jesus said to him, and I like this statement, he said, you have no power over me at all unless it were given you from above. Think about that. Our Lord standing at that, at that time, he wasn't afraid of Pilate. The Bible's clear that Jesus could have called legions of angels and, and he could have been delivered just that quick from Pilate. But he didn't do it. And the reason Jesus didn't do it is because he loved you and me so much that he was going to bear what we had coming. And then the religious leaders tell Pilate, they said it, they told him if he let Jesus go free that they weren't Caesar's friend and that they had no friend but Caesar. And then they cry again, crucify him, crucify him. And when Pilate's soldiers had further mocked Jesus, they took that robe off of him, they put his own clothes upon him, and they led him away to Golgotha, or Calvary, to be crucified. And at some point, Jesus fell under the weight of the cross, as he was carrying his cross, he fell under the weight of the cross, and the Bible says Simon from Cyrene took Jesus' cross and finished the journey. What an honor that would have been to be able to bear Jesus' cross. My, my, my. What an honor Simon had that day. And of course, on the way to Calvary, Jesus had some things to say to the Ladies are there, they're called the daughters of Jerusalem. He, he prophesied some things to them. Upon arriving at, at Calvary, Jesus was offered a narcotic drink. It was a painkiller is what it was. And he refused that painkiller. And at 9 a.m., Jesus is crucified between two thieves, one on the right side, one on the left side of him. And again, like with that scourging we talked about a moment ago, the Bible said they crucified him. And it's real easy to read over that word crucify. And well, they crucified the Lord. You ought to study in into some. You ought to study sometime into what it meant to be crucified. What that was like. A terrible, horrible, horrible way to die. They crucified him. They nailed him to the cross and suspended him between heaven and earth. And again, don't ever forget, let's never forget, he was crucified for you and me. He took that place on that cross that was for you and me, but Jesus went there for us. And so at 9 a.m. on Wednesday morning, some 2,000 years ago, he's crucified between two thieves. And there's a writing posted over his head that says, This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And then Jesus made several cries or statements from the cross. And there were seven of them in all. And first of all, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What an example that is. Think about that. After all that he'd gone through and, 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 and with the crowd there, you know, that had mocked him and, 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 and many in that crowd around that cross would mock him and say, you know, if he's the son of God, you know, come down from the cross. And during all of that, Jesus, the Lord, he's saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. What an example for you and for me. We need to forgive people too. No matter what they've done to us, we need to forgive. Of course, the soldiers divided his garments and cast lots for his clothes. The religious leaders again mocked Jesus. It's interesting, both thieves initially reviled at Jesus and had negative things to say. But sometime, at some point, the one thief repents. It's, it, 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 it's encouraging to me to know that even at a late hour, even at a midnight hour, so to speak, 
repentance is possible. And that, and that, that thief, that one thief, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Think about that. And in a moment's time, a man who had led such a sinful life repents and gets saved. Misses hell. He's just, he wasn't too far away from going to hell. And just that quick, his eternal destiny has changed. Think about that. But one of those thieves repents. And then, of course, comes Jesus' second cry or statement. And he tells that thief, he says, you'll be with me in paradise, or Abraham's bosom. And that's the place, of course, in the spiritual realm, in the inner part of the earth where Old Testament believers went when they died. Of course, there was a great gulf fixed, and on the other side of that gulf is a place of torment called hell. But of course, that thief, because he repented, Think about that, nailed to a cross, ready to die, and he cries out to the Lord, and now he's going to miss hell and, 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 and go to paradise instead. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's what that thief did, and he got saved. It's the greatest decision he ever made. Praise God. And he missed hell, and he went, to, he went into, into Abraham's bosom. Thank God for it. Anyway, then, in the process of time, the third statement Jesus made from the cross, he looked at John, who was there, along with Jesus' mother. You know, there's a lot of people around that in that area of the cross observing all of this. A lot of people. And some were believers and some were mockers. As I said a while ago, some of them were saying, you know, if, if he's the Christ, if he said who he, if he is who he said he was, let him come, you know, let him come down from the cross and all of that. But, but there were believers there also, and Mary was there, his mother, and other, other people, and John was there, and his third cry said, woman, behold your son. And at that moment, Jesus turned his mother over to John, so that now John would, would care for her the rest of her life. Think about that. Our Lord nailed to the cross and he's cognizant about his mother and he wants to be sure that she's well cared for the rest of her life. He, Jesus is wonderful. Ah, he's good. And then he makes a fourth statement or a cry from the cross. And uh, I'll read this from Matthew 27 verse 45. Now from noon until the Ninth hour, which was 3 p.m., there was darkness over all the land. So Jesus went on the cross at 9 in the morning, and now it's high noon. And there's darkness comes over the face of, the, of that land for, th for a three-hour time period. Because Jesus is going to die about 3 o'clock that afternoon. But it's noon at this point, and there's darkness comes over the face of the land. And oft times in Scripture, darkness is symbolic of the judgment of God. And about 3 p.m., Jesus cries out in this fourth cry. He says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's interesting that th th when you study into this, what happened right here is that all the sins of mankind were laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only all the sins, but all the sickness and disease were laid upon him as well. And all the mental malady was laid upon him as well. Think about that. One man in one place, suspended upon a cross, all the sins and iniquities of mankind laid upon him. Sickness and disease all being born in his body, along with all mental malady. Think about that. Think about that. I'll have some more to say about that in just a moment. And the Bible says, you know, 
when he, when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The prophet Daniel made a statement about this. And he said that Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. And in this moment, Jesus was cut off. Cut off from the Heavenly Father. You think about that. He was cut off, but not for himself. He was cut off for you and for me. We deserve to be cut off. But he came and was cut off for us. And then his fifth cry comes and he says, I thirst. And this time he was given a non-narcotic drink to quench his thirst. And then the sixth cry comes and he says, it is finished. Now much can be said about this, but I just wanted to look at just a couple of things. And let me just read from my notes. When Jesus said, it is finished, he was declaring the end of all the Old Testament animal sacrifices. Because you see, the ultimate sacrifice had finally been made. Atonement was completed, perfected, and fully accomplished. It was done once and for all, finished forever. In that divine mo moment when Jesus cried, it is finished, all the Old Testament prophecies about his earthly ministry were fulfilled. The justice, the justice of God had been fully satisfied by the Lamb of God. At that moment, the sacrifices of the Old Testament could permanently cease, for the perfect sacrifice had laid down his life for the salvation of all mankind. The Lamb of God took away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And then also, it is finished when he said that, he took our place on the cross. It's interesting. Listen to this. We owed a debt that we could not pay. And he paid a debt that he did not owe. And with his precious blood, he paid our debt. And when he paid it, he paid it in full. It is finished. Debt paid in full. The debt was mine. The debt was yours. It wasn't his, but he came and he paid it for us. And only he could do it. The virgin born son of the living God. Only his blood could pay the price. And then his final cry from the cross, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And Jesus dismisses his spirit. He yields up his spirit. His spirit leaves his body and his body physically dies. Now, I've been asked over the years, where did his spirit go? And uh, I, I, I've taught a lot about this over the years, but for, for the sake of today, I'll give you a, a, a little assignment. If you want to find out where his spirit went, for those three days and those three nights until he was raised from the dead. You can look at Acts 2, verse 27, and Romans chapter 10, verse 7. And that'll answer, those two verses will, will help answer that question for you. And so he physically dies, he yields up his spirit, and there's an earthquake. The Bible says the temple veil is torn from top to bottom. Instead of typically, you know, in an earthquake, it would go from bottom to top. But it was, it was from top to bottom. And the significance of this is that God was tearing that temple so that now not just the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement could go into the presence of God, but now as a result of what Jesus has done, all believers in Christ will have access to God the Father through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's exciting. Glory to God. And then, interesting statement to me here, interesting thing here. 
about the centurion and the other soldiers that were guarding Jesus. I want to read from Matthew 27, verse 54. Listen to this. So when the centurion and those with him uh, who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly. Think about this. Roman soldiers now feared greatly, saying, "True." Now listen to what they said. Truly, this was the Son of God. They were moved so by what had happened, it appears to me they became believers. And at least they declared that Jesus was the Son of God. You know, the Bible says that during the time Jesus hung on the cross, that many hid their faces from him. And, uh, you know, you think about it, being out there that day, Jesus dying upon the cross, it said many hid their faces, the people hid their faces from the sight of Jesus on the cross. And I want to just take a moment and, and talk about that with you as, as to why they did that. And the answer is found in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 14. And I want to read this from a few different uh, translations. Isaiah 52, 14. Listen to this. Why did the people hide their faces from him? Let me read. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. Another translation says, For many the servant of God, talking of Jesus, became an object of horror. Many were astonished at him. Another translation says this, But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. Here's another translation. Everyone was appalled. He didn't even look human. A ruined face, disfigured past recognition. Think about that. You know, the scourging that Jesus went through by the Roman soldiers, as horrible as that was, probably didn't cause this what we're talking about right here, right now. What probably caused it, and I'm confident of this, as bad as that scourging was, and all the beatings, you know, and so forth that we talked about, but Remember when he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I believe at that time, as I said a, a moment ago, but I want to reiterate it. Think of it. All the sins and iniquities of all human beings who would ever live were laid upon him. Think about that. All the sickness, all the disease, all the mental malady laid upon one man in one place on Calvary's cross. I believe that, along with the scourging, of course, but I believe that is what caused this disfigurement, if you will. And then another translation says, Isaiah 52 says, They shall see my servant, that's Jesus, beaten and bloodied, so disfigured one would scarcely know it was a person. And then it goes on to say, so shall he cleanse many. Of course, the many that he would cleanse would be those who would believe upon him. But what does it mean, so shall he cleanse many? Well, that's talking about the precious blood that he shed that day. And just a few uh, uh, scriptures, I'm not going to give you the references, but I'll just quote them for you about the blood of Jesus that he shed for us that day. Listen to what the Bible says about his precious blood. It says, Jesus made peace for us with God through the blood of his cross. We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We're justified by his blood. 
justified. It's justified, never sinned. I like that word, justified. Justified, never sinned. The blood of Jesus, see, the blood of Jesus doesn't just cover sins. That's what the blood of the animals did in the Old Testament. But remember, if something's covered, it can be uncovered. Jesus' blood doesn't just cover sins. Jesus' blood washes them away just as if they never happened in the first place. I mean, that's shouting ground. I mean, that's exciting. By his blood, we are just justified, declared righteous. Glory to God. That's exciting. With his own blood, then the Bible also says, with his own blood, he obtained eternal redemption for us. And then the Bible also says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near. That means brought near to God. See, there was a time we were all far away from God. But because of the blood of Jesus, the Bible says, now in Christ Jesus, you who, who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. So anyway, at the request of the Jewish leaders, Pilate had the soldiers break the legs of the two thieves. But since Jesus was already dead, they did not break his legs, but pierced his side and of course, you know, blood and water came out. Then Joseph of Arimathea, you know, that rich man, he requested Jesus' body from Pilate. He got the body. They took his body down, Jesus' body down from the cross. They wrapped it in linen cloth and laid his body in a new tomb in a garden nearby the site of the crucifixion. The Jews then asked Pilate to set a guard at the tomb and a large stone was placed at the opening. It was sealed, and the guard was set. So Jesus' body is in that tomb. And you're going to go look up and do that assignment and find out where his spirit went. And we're going to pick up right here on Sunday because the story is not over. Not by a long shot. Not by a long shot. Because you know and I know he came out of that too. And we're going to cover that this Sunday. So as I close, what happened the day Christ died? 2 Corinthians 5.19 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing our trespasses to us. That's good news. Colossians 2.14 says having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. See, because we're, we're sinners, there were uh, requirements that were against us. But Jesus wiped them out, glory to God. That's exciting. He wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he, t he took them out of the way and have nailed them to, to his cross. Glory to God. And then Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated, here's what else happened the day Christ died. That God demonstrated his own love toward us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then the last scripture I want to read for today is in Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. Surely, this is what happened the day Christ died. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. You see, with Jesus' death on the cross, he made provision for our spirit, that means eternal life, for our body, that's physical healing, by his stripes were healed, and for our mental realm, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Thank God that Jesus went to the cross and died for us. But like I said a while ago, I'm going to say it again. He didn't stay dead. He came out of that tomb. And we'll pick up here Sunday 
and uh, we'll go through the events of what happened at the resurrection. And I'm telling you what, that is shouting ground. I may just, who knows what, who knows what I might do. I, I get excited about it. But anyway, hey, hope you enjoyed this today. I think it's good to review what Jesus did for us. And this Friday, right here at 7, have your juice and your, your bread. We're going we're gonna to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and, uh, and, and it's going to be a good time. So I'll see you then. God bless you. Bye-bye.